welcome back. Here's part two of our lecture about Ekman layer winds. Now, in our first lecture of this module, we talked about the geostrophic wind, which was an excellent approximation to what real observed winds do in the free atmosphere. But the free atmosphere, and the free atmosphere is most of the Earth's atmosphere, but the lowest one kilometer, maybe two or three kilometers, your textbook says as much as four kilometers, makes up what is called the boundary layer, and the boundary layer is different. Now, one thing I haven't actually told you very much about is that the boundary layer, air tends to, air that's in the boundary layer tends to stay in the boundary layer. Air that's in the free atmosphere tends to stay in the free atmosphere. You can think of that boundary between, well, that's a bad choice of the word, that layer, that sep, that level that separates the top of the Ekman layer, the top of the boundary layer, from the free atmosphere as being kind of like a membrane. It doesn't really let air very easily mix from above the boundary layer down into the boundary layer. But still, the boundary layer is a pretty big place in the Earth's atmosphere. I mean, I have a little diagram that we're going to be building on this left side of the page here. And you can see how, you know, it extends a kilometer or two or three up, and it has two parts in and of itself. The surface layer, the lowest 50 to maybe 100 meters or so, and then the rest of the boundary layer, which your book is using the term Ekman layer. We'll see that there's pros and cons to that term in a future module. And th these are the places where wind power is generated. Wind power is typically generated either in the surface layer, if for a relatively low wind turbine, or possibly in the Ekman layer for a relatively tall wind turbine. It's a fairly big place, this here boundary layer. And throughout it, friction will be mattering. Friction, friction will be affecting the speed and, as we'll see, the direction of the winds, um, well, at least under certain conditions, but we'll get there. Now, the winds, the boundary layer has these two parts, the Ekman layer and the surface layer. The surface layer is a whole different story. The winds in the surface layer, you might even remember having seen that term as you reviewed for quiz one, that the winds in the bound in the surface layer follow a log wind profile and all this kind of stuff. We'll get to that in a future module. That's not what we're going to worry about right this moment. Today, in a lecture called Ekman Layer Winds, it's probably not surprising that what we're going to be talking about is the winds in the Ekman layer, that big chunk of the boundary layer. Now, I told you that the winds that we're going to be talking about in this lecture today apply to the Ekman layer under certain conditions. And your book just kind of glibly mentions that this will be under neutral conditions. Or, well, I hate that term. The right word is statically neutral. But whatever, what does that actually mean? Well, we'll learn more in the future as to what we actually mean about the about a layer of the atmosphere being neutral or statically neutral. But for our purposes today, what we mean is that it is well mixed, extremely well mixed that the atmosphere in this uh, layer is continuously mixing. Um, in the case of like the boundary layer and the Ekman layer and so on, we're typically talking about like updrafts and downdrafts, rising plumes of warm air from the surface, things like that, that are continuously mixing. And there's a lot of nifty properties to a layer of the atmosphere when it is well mixed or statically neutral. Um, not the least of which is that it's kind of the same, the air is kind of have the same properties uh, anywhere you go it, at any height in the boundary layer when it is well mixed. Uh, for example, the humidity, okay? Uh, whatever the humidity is at this height of the mixed layer, of uh, the mixed layer, of the Ekman layer, uh, it'll be the same at this height or at that height or whatever, okay? That's kind of what a property of being well mixed is, is that uh, your properties like humidity and other things you don't know about yet, like potential temperature and so on, will be the same no matter where you go. Um, that's what mixing means. I mean, if you are mixing up a cake batter, you put in whatever goes into cake, I don't know, let's say cake mix and eggs and, I don't know, oil or something, I don't know what's all in there, and you look at the bowl and it's clearly eggs and oil and cake mix, but once you mix, okay, there's places at first where there's lots of egg and there's places where there's no egg, but once it's well mixed, every place has about the same amount of egg. That's what well mixed means in the atmosphere too, okay? When the atmosphere is well mixed by like rising plumes of thermals during the day and stuff like that, you get an atmosphere that is well mixed. And that, one of the properties of that is that the atmosphere becomes statically neutral. Okay, we're going to just kind of put a little star by that for now and remember that term and we'll see it in the future as being important as to how wind production, is, uh, power production is going to work and so on. So the particular type of winds in the Ekman layer we're going to be learning about today are specifically under statically neutral conditions. There's going to be other types of conditions that we'll learn about in future modules. All right. We know that up in the
the free atmosphere, where we can make the geostrophic approximation, the winds are not being affected by friction. Friction is not slowing those winds down. So I've added an arrow to my diagram over there on the left side of the screen that is supposed to show like a geostrophic wind vector, okay? It's just like, I just wanted to put a big vector there that is like, that, think of that as that's the wind speed up there, okay? Now, we know that down in the surface layer where the air is actually touching the surface of the earth, that is, those are air parcels that are literally dragging their way through trees and power lines and across cities and stuff like that. That's where friction is actually happening and really slowing the wind down. So see how I added an arrow down there where it says surface layer that is much smaller than the arrow I added up there in free atmosphere? Because the winds down there by the surface are really going to be slowed down a lot by friction. But what about the air parcels that are in the Ekman layer? Those air parcels aren't actually touching the ground. How are they experiencing friction? Well, to understand why air parcels in the Ekman layer are going to be moving, are going to be affected by friction with the ground, even though they're not touching the ground, you need to remember that we said that we're working with conditions where the Ekman layer is very well mixed. There are continuously plumes of warm air rising and plumes of cold air sinking throughout the boundary layer at this time. Okay, this is a fairly common condition, like during the uh, day, for example. All right, so let's see how I drew those big swoopy arrows in there that are showing plumes of warm air rising from the surface through the Ekman layer, colder air sinking down from above, and so on. The, the Ekman layer is just continuously mixing under these neutral conditions. And, well, within the Ekman layer itself, we're taking some of these air parcels that are from down in the surface layer, where the speed is very slow, and we are mixing them with air parcels that are from higher up in the Ekman layer, where the winds are faster. And so if you mix air with a small amount of kinetic energy or a small amount of momentum with air that has a lot of kinetic energy or a lot of momentum, however you want to think about that there, you end up with air that has somewhere in between. You end up with air that is down, that is somewhere in between in terms of how much momentum or kinetic energy it has. Let's be a little more specific about how that's going to work. Down near the surface of the Earth, in the surface layer, momentum is, the, to use the parlance of meteorology, being destroyed. We are destroying momentum. Don't get all physics-y on me and say you can't destroy momentum and all that. that. It's just the terminology we use in meteorology. They are destroying momentum. Velocity is being extracted from the atmosphere by friction. Okay. The correct term for that kind of process in which something is being removed from the atmosphere is that it is a, this process is a sink. A sink, I threw a Google definition up here, I like the definition of sink here that's in yellow. A sink is a body or a process that acts to absorb or remove energy or a particular component from a system, like a heat sink. A sink is a process that removes something from the atmosphere. In ATS-113, the Introduction to Atmospheric Sciences, they learn about, like, for example, um, plants are a sink of carbon dioxide. They extract carbon dioxide from the Earth's atmosphere. Um, human respiration is a sink of oxygen. We extract oxygen from the Earth's atmosphere. In the same way, the surface of the Earth, the surface layer, is a place where the momentum of the Earth's atmosphere is being removed from the Earth's atmosphere, in this case by friction. The, there is a sink of momentum or a sink of kinetic energy at the surface due to friction. Meanwhile, up higher in the Ekman layer and up in the, in the free atmosphere, the atmosphere is trying to adjust to be in geostrophic balance, to, to speed up so that it is now back to the situation where pressure gradient force and Coriolis force are in balance and so on, and that is accelerating the wind and producing momentum Again, don't get all physics conservation momentum on me. We're, this, we're using just the terminology or the parlance of meteorology where they describe that as being a source of momentum. In other words, the winds are speeding up there. Hey, source, we've actually seen that term before. In fact, source and sink are a pair of terms in, in atmospheric sciences. A source in the sense of like a place or a thing or a process in which something can be coming from. In ATS-113, we talk about um, plants are a source of oxygen. They put oxygen into the Earth's atmosphere. Or 
uh, human respiration is a source of carbon dioxide. We add carbon dioxide to the Earth's atmosphere. The upper, atm the upper parts of the boundary layer, rather, are kind of like a source of momentum. As the wind speeds up, it adjusts to being back in geostrophic balance. We've actually seen this word source before, back in an earlier lecture where we were talking about pee in the pool. Do you remember that? The little kids were on one end of the pool, the big kids were on the other. And we said that there was a source of pee in the pool way on one end of the pool, and there was, well, we didn't use the word sink, really. We could have talked about, like, a sink of, of, of pee in the pool, though, on the close end of the pool here, just on this old slide I had here, maybe, like, a filter or something like that that was extracting pee from the pool. Okay, so we ended up with a pee gradient there, right, where there was more pee near the source and less pee near the sink. Well, we can use that same idea to think about what we should be thinking about momentum or kinetic energy or speed or however you want to do it in the, in the Ekman layer. I mean, we have a source of momentum up at the top of the Ekman layer, namely the air parcels trying to accelerate and be in geostrophic balance. And we have a sink of momentum or kinetic energy or velocity, or you want to think about it, down near the surface that is friction. And therefore, just like in the swimming pool where there was more urine in the pool near the little kids and less near the sink, the, the little kids were the source, and the filter or whatever that's on the other end of the pool is the sink, and we got a urine gradient or whatever in the pool. In the same way, we should have a gradient of velocity in the, in the Ekman layer. We should have faster velocities up near the source of momentum at the top of the Ekman layer, and we should have slower velocities down near the sink of velocity our momentum, where momentum is being destroyed, as we would say, uh, down near the uh, surface layer. And so see how uh, on the little diagram on the left-hand side, I made the arrows bigger and bigger as you go up? That's what we experience. We are actually seeing at different heights in the Ekman layer, the wind speeds are increasing with respect to height. Notice that all of these wind speeds are less than that geostrophic wind vector that I had up there in the free atmosphere. That's to illustrate the fact that all these winds are Oh, powerful vocabulary word here, subgeostrophic. Subgeostrophic means slower than geostrophic, okay? Not below the geostrophic wind, that would be a nifty word too. No, subgeostrophic as in slower than geostrophic, okay? But at any given location in the Ekman layer, it looks like the air at that location in the Ekman layer is experiencing friction with the Earth's surface. We say it's experiencing friction with the surface, even though that air isn't actually touching the surface. This is a tricky topic. AGS-113 students always want to know how in the world is this air, you know, two kilometers up, being slowed down by the forest that's down below it. Well, we call it friction, but that's not really quite right. It's more like mixing with air that is at a different speed, and that air is at a different speed due to friction. Right? Air that actually had to drag itself through the forest down at the surface layer and got really slow, then ended up mixing with the higher velocity air up in the Ekman layer and slowed it down. Okay, But mixing with air that is a different speed and that air is a different speed due to friction doesn't exactly roll off your tongue. And as a consequence, we kind of call it friction, even though it's not exactly friction. Okay, it's friction down in the surface layer where the air parcels really are touching the trees, the power lines, the billboards, the buildings, the hills. But up in the rest of the Ekman layer, it's a slightly more complicated process that's creating that that um, that gradient, that vertical gradient of the velocity in the Ekman layer. Um, but notice how important the mixing was to this process. The fact that there was all of this churning going on in the in the boundary layer at this time, where we were continuously taking air that had driven down by the surface that had slowed down and lifting it up into the Ekman layer and mixing it with air parcels up there so that we ended up slowing down the winds in the Ekman layer. If there were mixing going on, if the conditions were not statically neutral, um, we'd get something very different, more like what I have drawn on the left-hand side right now, where the winds in the Ekman layer would be pretty darn fast. In fact, they might even be geostrophic. In fact, they might even get faster than the geostrophic, but that's a topic for a different day. Meanwhile, down there, why would they be so fast? Because they're not being slowed down by air from the surface layer mixing up with them. And similarly, that air down there by the surface layer, well, it would get slower and slower by friction, and it has no way of mixing. You know, it's a two-way street. The faster air from down in the Ekman layer also gets mixed down to the surface that speeds those winds in the surface layer up. 
if there's no mixing going on, there's no way to get that fast air from up above you down to the surface. In fact, this is going to happen important situations in the Earth's atmosphere, like at night. Okay, we're going to learn later in, in a later module about how at night the winds look more like this, where the winds are very weak near the surface, and they are much stronger when you get a few hundred meters above the surface, and, well, that's going to happen when the atmosphere is not statically neutral. It's going to have a different condition going on. Oh, this is pretty slick. So this discussion gave us a powerful way to know about the speeds of the wind that we should be expecting at different heights of the Ekman layer. Okay, fantastic. And you know, honestly, for the purposes of wind power, mostly what we care about is the speed of the wind. I mean, the, the direction is in some ways not quite so important because the turbine will just pivot to face up wind. I mean, that's not really a problem. But for a class that's about understanding how the winds are working in the atmosphere, we need to know also what's up with the direction. And that's what we're going to talk about in the third part of this lecture today. But before we get to that part, let's answer a couple quick questions about what we just saw. Question three. In the Ekman layer, winds blank. A, increase with respect to height. B, decrease with respect to height. Or C, are geostrophic. In the Ekman layer, hey, let me give you a, let's play under statically neutral conditions, if that will help. Okay? Which of those three is the right choice? Make a choice from your options and get a little feedback before you move on to question four.